Uh, first off, I want to thank you guys for coming. We're kind of spread out. Um, beautiful day. So I know there's guys that got to mow hay down and bale hay and take care of cows and have quite a few of our customers around this area that couldn't make it today. Um, but before we get started, um, we have a, a, a deer customer and a neighbor of ours that they lost their house in a fire here a couple nights ago. Um, so if you could just keep them in your prayers and they've got two boys, um, uh, Taylor Overman and his wife Brooke, they wouldn't mind me sharing that. They lost their house in that fire the other night from that storm and uh, is a terrible, terrible thing, but they're all okay. So praise God for that. Uh, material things, you know, they come and go, but their family's good. So they're, they're doing good, but just keep them in your thoughts. They're a great customer of ours, great neighbors. And so we wanna think about them. Um, so today we are, what we're gonna do first is, which seems a little backwards, but we've done it the last couple years and it works. We're going to go visit a couple fields, uh, look at some irrigated corn, look at some dry land corn, and we're gonna kind of make a route down this gravel road. And to save you guys from sweating a lot, we're gonna kind of make our way to our church, which is just a couple miles as the crow flies. It's actually on the way. And we're gonna have our presentations there and lunch there in the air conditioning. So give it up for some air conditioning, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, so that'll be nice. But uh, we're gonna cover a few things today. Um, some products that Nature's Formula offers. And uh, first off, real quick, um, kind of one of the things we're highlighting this this time, this field day, is our biocharged seed treatment. I think you guys each got a, a, a brochure on that. So we created this biocharge for our seed um, to do everything that we can from the get-go. So we've got the full load of inoculant, We've got a natural fungicide. We have a natural insecticide. And I've had a lot of questions about what all it contains. And we'll go over that more in depth in the presentation at the church. But I just wanna cover it real quick. Um, we have a mobile unit. Uh, this treater right here, um, you just hook it up to a gooseneck and take off rolling. So we will be doing some of that um, we'll talk more about that as well. But I wanted you guys just to see it and get a visual because the rate, you can have a great product and you can mess it up by misapplication, you know, not getting enough rate on. Uh, it's a science. And so that's, that's what we focus on is doing everything right um, so you don't have problems later on. So the application rate is a huge deal. Um, this treater, so if you look, just kind of explain how it works, which we can go over here real fast before we head out to the fields. So pretty simple, You, your seed goes in this black seed hopper right here. All right, and then it's got a seed wheel with a dial. So we have everything calibrated and it takes, if I'm treating two different varieties of seed or even like wheat or beans and say I'm running a batch of wheat through and then I need to run a batch of beans through, um, we can do that on the fly, all right? You got a scale that we take with it and you measure your seed size, get your weights, dial it in, and then you're ready to go. We've got a program on a computer that tells you um, your how to dial it in and everything. So um, very easy to do that for guys that have several different varieties, several different soybean sizes, such as the, uh, that nature. So seed goes in that hopper, turn the seed wheel, uh, that's last, but so we've got, a conveyor that comes from the seed hopper into 
um, the drum. So we have an atomizer in here that sprays the treatment on the seed and gets it coated well. Then it goes into the drum. So as that seed's flowing through, it's spraying it, and then it goes into the drum and it tumbles and it gets good coverage. It drops out of the drum by gravity into that outlet conveyor and then it's got a stair step deal kind of custom job built on the end of it with a fan and you know like i said it's all science we have we do a lot of coverage so sometimes in soybeans you don't see it in corn as much but in soybeans um, if we just move it one time then there's no bridging issues um, because we we get a full coat on there so so this is kind of how it runs so you turn the outlet on turn the drum on then you would turn the inlet on and the itemizer so that's it right there and it takes us about the way we have it set right now it takes us about two minutes takes us about two minutes to run 50 units through it. So um, it goes pretty quick and we can ramp that up, but the way we have it slowed down, we think it does a lot better job. And uh, that's what we're about is doing a good job. So is there any questions about kind of the process on how we treat? We'll get into why and what it is more. When you said units, did you mean pounds or? I said, I'm curious what you what you define units. I mean, sure. So, like a bag of soybeans will be a unit. So there's 140,000 seeds in a bag, which is a unit of of soybeans. Okay. Um, a corn, you know, a bag of corn, a unit of corn. Um, there's 80,000 seeds in a unit of corn. So, okay. um, so per bag, essentially. It takes about two minutes to treat 50 bags. So it goes goes pretty quick, which is about a pallet. About a pallet worth of seed. So any other questions about how we get the, the, the treatment on the seed? With this treatment, do you stuff to run talc, graphite, or is it already? So we run a powder that helps. It's kind of a slicker. Um, we could under, you know, we could do more. Um, there, there is another coating process that we could add on, but it's such an expense. I feel like graphite for the farmer is a lot better option. Um, so yeah, I mean, you can technically run it through your planter like that, but I'm not going to stand behind like, yeah, your seed plates are going to wear out faster and, and that sort of thing. I'm definitely not going to guarantee that that won't happen because you should run graphite at least through them. So we actually, with our treatment, um, we get along good with majority graphite. Um, but yeah, that's a great question. Any other questions? Do you have anything you want to add? What is the Yeah, so we'll, we'll talk about that at the church as well. Um, so the colorant in the, tr in the treatment, um, we're working on, so we, we are working on like um, OMRI approvals um, because this is an all natural treatment, which you think all natural and until you actually get into that. Um, these products that we have, the microbes that we have to use, all natural seems like you would normally classify that as weak sauce. Like, oh, it's natural. It's, there's no way that works. Uh, but we're going to look at our fields, and you guys can decide that for yourself. Um, that's what a field day is all about, going out in the field, looking at it. Um, we have, I guess I'll go ahead and tell you, so our program on corn is full seed treatment, uh, which obviously the majority of our seed comes pre-treated, right? We can't hardly ever get naked corn. Uh, you can get naked non-GMO corn, which we did, which is what's in this jar here. 
and we did plant some of that. Um, the rest of it's already going to be pre-treated from the company and we leave the color out and treat right over the top of it and we had no flowing problems, no clogged seed tubes, we got along great doing that. Uh, so the only thing we pull is the color, treat right over the top of it because a lot of times uh, seed company's treatment does have like a dry powder on it so we don't want to mess that up with a color, um, kind of have a reaction there so we don't want to do that. Um, but on our corn, so we ran, um, last year we did not run any P and K, we did not run any nitrogen, that sounds crazy. Um, we did grow corn even amidst the drought. Uh, we mowed and baled a lot of corn instead of chopping it for silage, uh, but we harvested quite a bit too. And it, it got zapped by the heat pretty hard. So it wasn't a very good look at things, but the more we studied um, the needs of our corn, corn crops, we, we figured that 100 pounds of nitrogen, and honestly, we don't, if you give, we look at our, our litter program, so we run litter here, and we run a ton to the acre, and which doesn't seem like much either, but we look at it more as microbe food. So we're gonna feed our microbes in the soil, and they're gonna in turn uh, take that and make enzymes to feed our plants and sustain them throughout the growing season. So that's what we've done. All of our corn ground has a ton of litter. It has 100 pounds of nitrogen, irrigated and dry land. So it's all the same. We ran just flat rate over everything. No variable rate, flat rate, uh, no P and K, except for the ton of litter. So that's what we'll see out there. The soybean ground, we sowed rye. We've had several guys ask us about cover crops. We sowed rye down in the fall behind the corn and we came in. We did not destroy the rye. We actually let it just run its course. We dropped in, planted in it. And um, you know, the only issue that I've found was it's so thick, it's hard to get herbicide to penetrate uh, that canopy of the rye. So they, these beans have actually been sprayed once with Roundup and then we didn't have any moisture and I didn't think I could kill the water hemp with Liberty. So they're about to get sprayed because we have got a shot of rain. And so this field out here, none of these bean fields have been sprayed along this gravel road with Liberty, just Roundup when the beans were, oh, about third trifoliate. So um, that's kind of the deal on them. No fertilizer, no litter, nothing, just the rye grass on the beans and the seed treatment. So does that make sense? You guys can uh, take a look at it. Uh, real fast, what we've seen out of the seed treatment, and we'll cover more of this later, I'm trying not to be long-winded, is we've had great control of insects above and below ground. Um, my garden, all my corn got treated. Um, with my biocharge treatment, um, green beans, everything. And my wife really enjoyed picking green beans that weren't ate up, so that was cool. Um, sweet corn, same way. Uh, the, thing, the thing to remember is just like when you spray your application of BioSure Grow with the Plus B, which some of you guys, that sounds super foreign, and we'll go over that at the church as well. It's a microbe, so they have to ingest it to kill the bug. So you have to have feeding on your plants to die. But the feeding is very minimal compared to not. And we can walk out in this bean field up on the gravel road and you'll see when the beans were coming up through the rye, the insects, it was kind of a harbor for insects in that rye grass. And so they fed on those beans as they were short and then you can tell when it stopped. There was no insecticide applications. You can tell it just, they all went away. We had dead grasshoppers, dead crickets. We had um, dead stink bugs. I mean, lots of dead stuff out there. Um, so yeah. We'll go out, we'll, if you guys wanna drive, um, that way you're not stuck at the church without a vehicle. We'll just kinda carp, you know, just 
make a convoy. We'll go up here to the gravel road and we'll drive up and we'll stop along the road, walk in the fields and we'll talk out there about what we're looking at. Can I ask one thing real fast? You bet. So you've got all these different farmers. Can you take this to every place? To treat seed or uh, does it get treated here and then you take it home? Right, so that's a good question. Um, we were going to cover that over there, but I'll go ahead without my laptop and all the logistics in front of me. I'll just kind of wing that question. So we've talked a lot about this because right now we have one that's mobile. And we have a lot of guys from Texas clear up to Minnesota that are going to want us to treat seed. So we are actually a seed dealer, and I say that we don't push it, right? Because we have friends that are seed dealers that's been in the area for years. And, and I try to, everything works together, but yet I try not to step on people's toes because that's a, some guy's livelihood solely depends on selling seed, and I understand that. So we want to respect that. But we do sell seed. So for us, the, the, the best thing, especially for soybeans and corn, because you know how it is, when do you get your beans in? Well, typically two weeks before they get planted, right, is when you receive your, your soybean seed. There is no way that we can hook up and take care, service everyone treating their beans. There's just no, no logistic way possible. But we can sell, so we are actually a dealer for Nutrient Ag Solutions. So we can sell guys in Texas seed, right? I mean, we can sell a, a 6.5 soybean that a guy down in South Texas might plant, or we can take aughts up to Minnesota or Canada so we can sell seed, name brand stuff that any guys anywhere in the U.S. could use. So we kind of are a seed specialist as well, but like I said, we don't push that on people. Um, you know, we can supply DeKalb, Asgro, LG, um, Agrigold, Brevant and Dynagro, which honestly, the house brand, if we're gonna talk seed, we'll talk some about that, because what we're about to look at is all Dynagro seed, and it's been, it's been a hammer for us, so it's, it's been great. Um, but yes, what we'll probably do is we will either allow guys to buy their seed off of us, and we can have it shipped here without a charge to the farmer, so they'll run the truck, bring it here, we'll treat it, load it up on our Conestoga, and haul it to the farm. Okay, so there's still enough savings there having it treated with our biocharge treatment, even if you have to pay $3 a loaded mile to come to your farm with a load of seed, it's still saving a guy, you know, 70, 80% so of the money. Um, we might be a little different. We'll just kind of tackle that as it comes because a lot of guys will bend their wheat and have it cleaned, have it at their farm in July, and you know we can start making routes and mapping the routes out to, to go treat wheat. But as far as corn and soybeans goes, um, we will, if, if, a, if a farmer has a professional treater or a friend or a seed dealer that says we can absolutely for sure get the correct rate because see it's all about getting the correct rate on so if, if if there's no doubt about it that they can run this stuff through their treater and get the correct rate then we will sell it in a jug to them um, but we've got to know for a fact because we can't stand behind it if it's not getting applied right Make sense? So hopefully that helps, yes. Is there a shelf life on the seed once you treat it? No. So, it's so it'll be, I'll, I'll stay with, I will stay with what uh, the seed companies will tell you. Your soybean seed, plant it that year. Don't hold it. So, because that's not necessarily gonna, we're actually making the seed stronger with the microbes but 
it loses germ naturally over the course of a year. So if you're getting soybean seed in and you're getting it treated, plant them. If you don't plant them, then um, if you think it's questionable, leave the coloring out and then you can still haul them to the elevator at least. So, because what we're putting on there doesn't hurt them. I mean, I, I would still eat them and I think you'd be fine, but so any other questions? I've had seed companies tell me that untreated seed will last till the next year, and I've had other seed companies tell me that if it's treated, it will last till the next year. And so, two different things being said out there. I think a lot of it depends on the company's treatment and what kind of chemicals they're putting in it, but the one I can't figure out is why a bare, you know, naked soybean wouldn't last. Um, but you know, but that's that's what I would say to that. If you're going to have them treated and plant them, plant them in that same season, and you'll be just fine. Any other questions before we head out to the field? Did I forget anything? You think? Uh, yeah, I told them the fertility program. Oh, you did? Yeah. And then the, uh, I did forget to mention, so we had pretty crazy weather um, early on. Got our corn sprayed late. Uh, the gallon of SureGrow was not put on yet. And so I was running out of days to get across all of our acres twice. So I put the gallon of SureGrow in with our uh, full strength of chemical and ran everything. So that's how I applied the gallon of SureGrow this year. Um, it, our, our gallon did not contain plus M or plus B. It was just a straight gallon of SureGrow, but we had the treatment on there. So that's why we're seeing the disease protection and the insect protection. So. Because it was on the seed. Because it was on the seed, yep. <laughs> So, all right, I guess we'll make our way to the field and uh, we'll stop along there and we'll walk down a pathway. Uh, we'll stop a couple times. So uh, that way you guys can kind of walk through the corn. Um, we'll, we'll meet out there. This is in an irrigated portion of the field. This edge of this corner right here we drive over it a lot with our big tractors and there's a little bit of a water hole down in here um, but we'll just kind of get up out of this slumpy corner and what you guys can walk in anything you want to um, but this is a um, 110 day variety and I don't know if everybody's up here yet but it's a Dynagro 50 VC09 it's a 110 day variety planted on April 10th at 10.32 p.m. No, I'm just kidding, but I'm sure I was out here at that time. But um, but yeah, it's actually a new hybrid. Um, first year we've actually got to see it. Um, I've been a fan, probably not our best corn, um, but it does throw a pretty decent ear, girthy ear. Most of them are 18 around. Um, not quite as as flexy as maybe some of the others, but it, it seems to be pretty good corn. Um, it is an irrigated number, so it's handled the stress pretty good. Uh, about halfway from maybe maybe a third of the way, maybe a, shoot, a fourth of the way down towards the highway is when the pivot stops watering. So most of this stretch that you came up the gravel road was dry land. Um, and still there's great corn out there. Um, but we'll look at dry land as we go, but this is the irrigated portion. Um, so 34,000 population. Um, Planted with a deer planter. Some guys always want to know that. I don't know if that's that important or not. Um, I do have Yetter Poly Twister closers. Um, that's pretty much all the information I can give you besides what I was wearing that day. We'll walk down here a little, a little ways, uh, get everybody up here, and uh, 
like I said, I'm not going to guarantee you that you won't find a live bug in the field. That's not what I'm saying, but our treatment does give a lot of protection against it. Um, so we can't say it's going to kill everybody, but it'll sure it'll sure take out a lot of insects. So um, yeah, it's not harmful to animals. I will say that. But uh, you guys can walk in either side. If you, um, we're gonna do a dig, so we'll probably walk in here. Uh, go as far as you want. I honestly don't care. Just please don't get lost. Uh, we will get hungry eventually and and hot, so we might leave you in the field. But 34,000 population, 110 day corn planted April 10th. 100 pounds of nitrogen and one ton of chicken litter with our treatment and a gallon of sure grow. That's the program. When you put the litter on? Uh, right before planting. So, Weston, how many days before planting did this litter get put on? Uh, three or four. Three or four. Okay, so same week. You didn't incorporate, did you? No. So we. That's a good question. All right, so he asked, um, you didn't incorporate it, did you? No, we did not. So we run 100% strip tillage with uh, ETS Soil Warrior. So we actually just strip tilled this ground uh, behind the litter. So we spread it our ton. We ran the strip till machine and put our 100 pounds of nitrogen on with urea through the dry boxes on the on the uh, soil warrior. So that was the program, which is why we have some decent compaction along this road here on these outside rows. That thing is kind of a wide booger, getting it in and out. So anyway, any other questions before we do a dig? So, Mr. Randy Sprinkle is the irrigation specialist, and he's standing to the north here, and he can probably answer that question. Uh, we've done five circles. We've done five circles at seven tenths each circle, and we did them four, uh, four and a half days, five days apart. And so every five days, this has had seven tenths on it with virtually no rainfall until the other night we had an inch and a half. And so everything's shut down right now. But we were holding our own with uh, seven tenths every five days. That's what it's been getting. And I've done it for five weeks, or uh, five circles. We had a little bit of rain to start us off uh, how much rain did we have when we started? We we didn't start real early because we had a little bit of rain. I think we had like an inch or so there earlier. And then when we started watering, we really never quit. Right. And that was like right before it tasseled, we had yes. that shower. Yes. Because I know we you've been watering hard since tassel. Yes. Yeah. So. so we've done five circles at seven tenths every five days. Any other questions? We're in the water ground here. Where? We're here. This is yes. irrigated right here. Yep, this has been irrigated. Um, we Our next field that we'll stop in, it will be, we might stop at two dry land fields just to give you guys a good idea that one of them is just not an, an anomaly. And I'm not saying our dry land is a bumper crop, but it, it has the potential still. We didn't totally burn it up. Uh, one of the things that we did notice um, was our program with the SureGrow and the treatment and our fertility management probably because where the well I'll go ahead and finish that sentence we have realized that our corn did not start to burn up as fast as the neighbor's corn um, it started to go first uh, the microbes help during stressful conditions there's absolutely no doubt about that um, we yeah, you guys will be able to see it out there in the dry land areas. But we have not lacked for any nutrition. Uh, corn looks good. I had the kind of head honchos out of 
out of uh, Nutrien come by and uh, they were ecstatic, said probably some of the nicest corn they've seen. They might tell everybody that. It's very possible. But uh, they looked at all of our acres and didn't find any disease pressure. Um, so very pleased, very pleased. You can save a lot of money not having to spend 35 bucks on a fungicide application. So anything else? We'll dig a plant up and see what we got going on under the ground. Do you mind if we look at some of your... Go ahead, yeah. Um, Who are your deals? Well, you know, so I did some math a couple years ago, and, you know, with 300 bushel corn out there, 250 to 300, if you strip an ear, you just owe me a nickel. It's not bad. So I won't make you pay up. You can take a souvenir home. Nope. I mean, I'm not a small kid. All 225 pounds. Oh, well, this one decided it. Oh. I think we're going to get this one up easier than the other one. Right there. Huh? Yeah. Looks like we're getting to All right, we got our dig. That ground is, you can tell it's been dry even with irrigating along. Um, I'd say it's probably, probably had minimum amount of water it, it could run on. But uh, we've got two plants side by side, population's perfect. We broke our roots off underneath. I had that spade up under there trying to pry it out of the ground and finally gave up but uh, we can shake some of that off um, I always I always enjoy um, having mr. Bill strange talk about uh, corn roots would you want to talk about the roots a little bit hey wait first I didn't see where you dug was that an end row or interior it was at one of the end rows. They didn't take everything. I mean, it wasn't this oh no 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 no. We were we were on a headland. Yes, exactly. Yeah, we were what eight ten rows in. Some more than that. Fourteen, sixteen. You're only a couple rows from the straights. Okay, so we were probably twenty rows in. It's twenty four row planter on the headland. It's twenty four rows. So we were almost to the to the straights then. So, yeah, Bill, go ahead. I want. I know. First off, I, I look at uh, how the root structure is, oh, and uh, this it's got a good good root structure, and you can see the feeder uh, roots co coming off uh, uh, of the the uh, uh, plant, and that's what feeds the plant. So the bigger root structure you got, the uh, um, uh, better uh, uh, absorption your plant's gonna get. Uh, if you'll notice the crown roots, there's minimal crown roots because your stalk's so healthy, uh, it, the mechanism in the plant is not telling them to put the crown roots on. Uh, so uh, uh, you have good structure. You want to cut it open? Yeah, we can cut it open. Just nobody cut their finger off. I was at a customer of ours a couple of years ago and slipped my thumb top to bottom with a razor blade. We want to look at that crown as well. Cut that. Cut that crown open, just take that thing and go straight down. This way. All the way down. So you don't want me to cut myself? No, just put it on here, I'll do it. Cut your I, I don't want to take you to the ER. Boom. Alright. As you well know, the nutrients flow through the center and you'll see how pliable it, it is so your nutrients can get to the top very easily and you don't have any disease in uh, 
because you you sometimes you can see the disease. So it's a it's a clean plant and a healthy stalk. Have you had any trouble with Japanese beetles? We Not we personally, but neighbors and persons. You know. We get hit pretty hard with Japanese beetles, and it's. It's been a great joy, and I can't tell if those are some dead ones there. No, but even so, you know how Japanese beetles work. They come in on the outsides and they go in, right? And you can still see the silks are on this corn, and we had them by the groves, didn't we? We had a lot of them. But yes, we can, and it's like, so we can't tell you that, yes, it's going to control them, right? Because it's not a pesticide, but yes, it will help. It will help with the uh, infestation for sure. I, I never saw any need at all to spray. Uh, being out in the corn water and I, I never saw any need whatsoever to spray for Japanese beetle. They just weren't, they weren't a problem. I didn't see it at all. As you can look at the corn and tell, the silks are still intact and, and look real good. So if we had a heavy infestation of it, they would be gone. Bought a neighbor's spray. And... Uh, airplanes buzzed around here a lot. <laughs> he, kept, he kept the skies hot. Yep. Yeah, I mean, when everyone else is throwing insecticide around, that almost makes us a hot spot for all the bugs to come to, but they don't because we've had hay guys, which we'll talk more at the church, uh, spray the sure grow on with the bug protection in it, and um, you can literally see where the line is with the grasshoppers. Um, so, yeah, the... The bug protection has been a great, a humongous asset for, especially for guys that do want to stick with non-GMO varieties or, uh, you know, organic. So it's something that they've never had before. So it's great to be able to bring that to the table. What and is your row spacing? It looks to me like it. 30 inch rows. 30 inch row spacing. Yeah. Any other questions before we go look at some dry land on the way to the church? Any other questions? This is a this is a grower from Nebraska, Sutton, right? And uh, Caleb's actually been using Nature's Formula products for about twice the amount of time as I have. I think you're eight years now. Um, so. Good guy right here and his dad, Ivan, and uh, it's been a pleasure to know Caleb. I'm gonna let him talk for a little bit. Uh, with the question on the Japanese beetle, uh, we've had them around the last three years pretty heavily, and we've only used the plus B, and we've, we've seen no yield drag uh, from not spraying an insecticide. Uh, just our experience up there, but same insect, uh, different region, but um, we've gotten pretty amazing control uh, with the with the plus B only out there. Tell them about the uh, fungicide with all your neighbors flying fungicide. <laughs> so we also just do the plus M as our fungicide treatment. Um, we're we, you know the planes as well are are very hot right now, uh, putting on that, and we just we just enjoy putting that $32, $35 in our pocket and not having any problem with fungus or mold. Um, and we, we have, uh, you know, agronomists as well that we partner with and, and all of them this year have gone in and, and said that, um, you know, if you did something, good job. If, if you didn't, you don't need to. So um, that's... Uh, that's kind of our story from this year, and I don't know. Was there was there one other thing that you were thinking of that about no, the? No, that, yeah, that was. It. <laughs> okay. And, and how long have you been doing just plus B plus M? Uh, since inception, what what year did you come out with it, Bill? I uh, I can't I can't remember the year. Uh, at about four years, I think. Yep. Uh, that sounds right. How, how many? At least that. Yeah. Yeah. What's your ideal? 
What do you feel is your ideal time or, or method of application on the plus M and plus B? Um, I, I really think that the, the wade and working with Bill is onto something with the seed treatment. We, we do treat with it as well, um, just we don't have as, as uh, fancy of a rig to do it. So we just kind of spray it on um, as it comes out of our seed tender. Uh, we, we do that with the plus B plus M, but then we also follow it up um, in furrow with a gallon. Um, and that seems to, we really have no problem the whole season, all, all throughout. Um, we get control on western bean cutworm. Um, and any in any worm cut any worm that uh, you know an earworm. Uh, so we get both both sides where anything that's going to try and feed on those roots, anything that's going to feed on the the fruit of the crop all the way through the whole season, we see control just from that one application up up front on the seed. So um, it makes it more cost effective that way. Um, putting it on with something you're already doing. We, were, we already had a liquid system on our planter and we chose to throw it in there and um, we pretty much haven't looked back since we've done that. Do you run one or two gallon of water with it? Or? We run one gallon, one gallon. Um, with it this year. We also use their P&K product um, is, is why um, on places that we didn't need to put some P and K, we ran three gallons of water. Otherwise we ran the one gallon of water with the two gallons of P and K and then the one gallon of the bio sure grow with the plus B and the plus M. Hey, wait, tell him about when you uh, went in with the plus uh, M on the standing corn with the hay to stop the, uh, the sudden rust. Sudden rust. So a couple, two years ago, 2021, we had southern rust come in real heavy. Uh, some corn that was planted in May and then had some later corn because of rainfall planted in June. And we didn't have it treated. Yes, it was not treated. Um, not treated, we did not have the seed treated. It was in furrow. Um, we had terrible outbreak of southern rust, so when if you guys have struggled with southern rust you know that uh it's going to come and take everything so your plants will be dead in seven days there's just no ifs ands or buts about it it is the worst disease that we face in in this part of the country um we come i come in there with uh, I, I said i don't care all of us agreed we got to stop it dead in its tracks so 13.7 ounces of Triva Pro, a gallon of Sure Grow with the Plus M, and we ran every acre and stopped that stuff and killed it dead right in its tracks. I ran a test on 10 acres. I only put the Plus M in there, and it stopped it and it fought against it. So the Plus M, for those of you who don't know, and we'll go through more of this at, at, at the presentation, it's an enzyme that fights against disease. So it gets on the leaf and in the plant and it helps as disease comes, it helps fight against it. It is not a curative, but I tried it out as a curative and it stopped it from getting worse and progressing, but and it didn't, the southern rust didn't kill that corn, but it, it, did, it did have a substantial yield drag um, from the rest of it. But the idea, the reason Bill created it was to prevent the disease, not to cure the disease when the disease is present. So that's what we're doing with it um, in the seed treatment. And so the other check that we did that year was I didn't spray anything on, on part of it. And it was so sorry, it made like 50 bushel. I mean, it was, it was terrible. That corn died. Um, with no fungicide and no plus M. Now, the seed treatment, we do have guys across the U.S. using um, SureGrow already, and the company, you know, we have come out before saying that it is ideal to put it on your seed. So just to cover that and kind of go back over what Caleb was saying, we took what we have 
our microbes to work with. And with Bill's help, we essentially reformulated it, um, ramped it up, put the right things in there so you have the right amounts on the seed and it's not you're not just winging it with regular sure grow plus b and m on the treatment so there was a lot of thought into it and like i said the science behind it it's working and um we we have full confidence to stand behind it um, so that's kind of what biocharge is um, it's it's our microbes um, that are reformulated to pack a, a big punch from the from the beginning. Is it, would you say that any different, Bill? Well, it's, you're getting you're getting your health you're getting your health started immediate, and that's the, the key. It uh, the the seed is the start of the plant. And if you can protect the seed and make it uh, perform quickly, uh, you get a better root structure and you, your prevention goes through the plant as it grows. And, and what we've seen here, um, as far as what works best, so we used to be in furrow. Um, as Bill preaches balance, getting your soil in balance. And with balance comes less disease, less pest pressure. Um, these guys have been on the, the sure grow side for eight seasons now. Um, they, they're restoring balance. We are restoring balance here. But what, what we're doing is with that is we're finding because well, we used to be in, in in furrow so we found that the plus b and m works in furrow but if you think about it and you it'd be easier to do this in inside but look at our look at our corn spacing so let's just look at this right here for example okay we're putting down a gallon to the acre in furrow all right, and when these seeds, you guys know how, how big a seed is, I don't have to do that. When these seeds are laid in the ground, you know, eight, 10 inches apart, and you're dribbling that stuff in furrow over them, your seed's already on the ground, you're putting it on top, and 90 some percent of it is going on the soil. The plus B microbe and the plus M enzyme was created to be taken in through a living organism, whether it be plant tissue or the seed, because the seed is living, all right? When that microbe, the plus B or the M, hits the soil, you're not getting that benefit from it. You are still getting all the nutritional and fertilizer benefits out of the sure grow going in furrow. Yes, absolutely. But the, the, we are all about making things better. So if we can ramp it up, make it a better product, fully coat the seed, I'm talking a full coat, put it in, and now if a guy wants to run in furrow, great. Or he, the way it's designed is to spray it over the top if you have that ability. Um, we have been nervous about spraying herbicide with the full gallon rate but this year um i mean our fields are a testament it worked because what, what we were scared of is bringing some of the weeds back because the sure grow uh it, it just helps things thrive so when you spray those microbes with an herbicide on on the on the weeds it will they'll die faster but yet we were scared of keeping, bringing them back to life because um, that's just kind of the nature of BioSure Grow. But it did work, and that's a great way to do it in one pass. Do you, do you think your corn come up to shade the weeds out? 
possibly to keep them at bay or well i mean there's definitely there's definitely that and I, we don't run quite as much uh chemical like herbicide as we used to especially residual because with balance in your soil comes better weed management as well um, they don't thrive as much as they do in imbalanced soil but yeah i mean that corn was was getting kind of taller i mean we were up there v6 v7 um, i used three ounces of lotus 32 ounces of roundup and uh, 64 ounces of degree extra so there's it's not a, a full load of degree extra or atrazine but it was enough by the time we got canopy to to keep the corn clean so yes sir any other questions before we anybody melting yet all right we'll uh, make our way back to the vehicles and we'll stop at some dryland corn so you guys can get a look at it It's 114 day dryland corn, uh, Dynagro 5434. This is a corn that we've uh, had for a couple years. It's it's great from central northern Nebraska clear down to the delta. I mean, this corn can can do it all under pivot or dryland. It is not like the the like super super stress dryland where like you know you can plant it and you'll make a hundred bushel no matter what happens this does have some top end if you get the weather um, a couple guys asked the corn that we drove by up on the hill yes that is the same field that we were in dry land ridge with no topsoil with a racehorse corn on it that probably burned up a month ago <laughs> it still has ear on it i mean it might make 100 bushel up there on that ridge but uh, so some of you guys might have seen our YouTube video we have this is where we did we shot the hog manure video so we had that half of the field on that side of the slough had hog manure and this side didn't 6,000 gallons of hog manure out of a pit this side had none it's kind of like the three little what is that I don't know this one had all of it and this one had none. But anyway, same fertility program, 100 pounds in, a ton of litter. Um, that side, we felt like might have a yield drag. Um, it did turn faster, just right on the other side. And it's a little bit, you know, there's, there's a little elevation change, but uh, this is a flat field all the way through. Um, that's about, that's about it. You guys can just walk in here. Uh, we probably won't do a dig because the roots are going to look the same. And unless somebody wants to pull their back out and pull one out, I'm I'm good with just leaving it. So, but let's take a look in this corn. Um, if you you can walk a easy path in here on the sprayer track, and you guys, there's a there's an old driveway and house site right here. So it's a little compacted in this old drive, but you can walk in and go straight, take a right, whatever you want to do. This corn was almost to die before we got eight tenths of rain last Friday. So it kind of revived it. 28,000 population, if I didn't say that already. the silage chopper in here please sometimes yeah this did not this did not have the hog manure zero gallons of hog manure
Yeah, there's some waste corn the chopper here. on this yeah. round. I want to get the irrigated, okay. irrigated stuff. You got to get that hot done. Yep. You don't want to waste it on this stuff. Mm. What's that? Well, this is the yeah. Just wasting the Yeah, out there, here. it was touch and go. I mean, <laughs> honestly, had we not got those eight tents, we would. We would have been in a world of hurt. Are you David? I'm David, yeah. I'm, I'm really it would have been small, you know. Okay, the corn would have been small. Yeah, yeah. Well, you got it at the right time, too. Right? Yeah, barely. You guys get Which, that's there? one of the things about the microbes and the sure grow that we've noticed is your stress tolerance is better and it will stay with you. So, when you're not getting rain for four weeks and that corn's trying to fill, it's, it's gonna hang on for dear life. And when you get a shot of water, it like, you can see it, it just pushes. I mean, we're talking one to two days, 24 to 48 hours, you can actually see it push. I mean, the husk will get tighter, and it's just those microbes can do what they do in milliseconds, you know? I mean, they're they're exchanging very quickly at a rapid pace. Kind of like so, steroids. Yeah, kinda. So you give them a shot of water, and they know they're behind, that plant's behind, it needs to do something, or it's not gonna produce. Because its whole goal is to produce grain. So that's what we've noticed with the sure grow a lot on, on stressed uh, crop fields is they'll hang with you a lot longer and then when you do get a shot of water, boy, they'll push like crazy. They'll do everything they can for you. So, yeah. Take this one off with full population here. Not too shabby for some dry land corn this year, right? I pulled that one off right here between two good ears. So you can see where it went through its heat stages. Yep. Yeah. It shrunk down and then it shut sure back did. Yeah, yeah. You, that's, that's what I was telling you. It, it, it almost pinched off right yep. there. Yeah. That's what I was telling him. Like it'll stay and stay and stay and yeah. stay with you, and then it gets a shot of water, and it's just like. You can see it just yeah. push in a push in, in a day or two. Hand. Yeah, isn't it part of that from pollination too? A little bit. Yeah, a little bit there. A little heat stress. It was starting to pull it back but though. It was starting to pull it back okay. here on after it pollinated. It probably all pollinated and then it just went in, went into its pinching cycles. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. But I mean, shoot, that's going to be heavy corn. Yeah, that's got some weight. Feel that, David? That's got some weight to it. <clears throat> Then we got some, I think some of these dwarf plants that we end up with have bad seed. Some of these. You guys with me all the time. Yeah. <laughs> you need a stage crew. In, in Iowa, it was literally like trying to like block all the corn. Well, you think everybody's super hot? Yeah, yeah. You think it's a lot they're enjoying more cooler it. now than it was standing out there in that sun. Now the sun, this is a little greener. We had some irrigation to pipe that carries through here. No uh, kidding. Yeah, traveling gun, that'd be. So, that'd, that's what I, I just signed a contract yeah. with the neighbor to put a riser in over here and oh, a traveling really? gun, yeah, and water it and out of the hog pit. Yeah. Hog lagoon, yeah. yeah. We used to have soft toes. We used to pump all our guns with soft toes irrigation. That was my job. Oh, shoot. As soon as I got big enough to do it, oddly enough, that was my job, so. Just stringing that stuff everywhere. <laughs> yeah. That's why we're takes off the gosh. Oh, man. Well, the work you do to water 10 acres is enormous. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> How's your alfalfa doing this year? Yeah. Fair. fair. I mean, tonnage wise, fair. I mean, it's still green. I, sh I was going to take a picture before I left home to show you, but I forgot. That's you know, all right. Drive, but, uh, I mean, it's, it's held right in there. You know, we're still making 45, 50 bales. we real close to all the way through. This size. Wow. And so I'm getting ready to start my fourth. Are you? Yeah. yeah. As, soon as, they, as soon as the weather clears. Awesome. Uh, but yeah, no, it looks good and it's zero commercial. Yeah. It's all awesome. Fine, sure go. Awesome. I might have you. I might have you tell a little bit about it when we get to the church. Not a lot. Because there's I mean, some. That is my main. That is. Uh, I'll, get, I'll get it. Don't worry about it. I got it. I was interested to hear some. Uh, 
Okay. You, you know, some uh, yeah. strategies Man. on how to use it and take it. Did you have to yep. do that? Yep, we're going to talk about that. Could you? And I know you're Might have you, you talk a little bit. If you, you don't mind. Just, I don't mind. Okay. I don't mind. Like I mean, I know you talk to all your no, employees yeah, all the time, so. Yeah, it's 1146. Yeah, awesome. I, I, don't, I don't mind talking. <laughs> I don't know much about it. What number is it? It's 5434. Yep. It's been a good corn. We planted it. This is our third year planting it. It's been a good corn. Yeah. Yeah. This, this corn is a long corn. Good enough. This one's pretty good. It's going to dry as we work. We got about an inch. And the impressive thing is that you've got good pollination. Here, she can't hear you in the car. Oh, I have nothing to say. <laughs> I can kind of hear it still just a little bit. It's okay. picking up. Yeah. Yeah. When did that little thing pop up and just swell yeah. over? Yeah. What night was that? And then we got yeah. Friday night. Yeah. Friday night. Last and then what night, night was it? it not this past night. Sunday night. Friday right before. Yeah. Friday before. Yeah. And then yeah. Sunday yeah. night. Sunday night we got inch and a half. Yeah. But that little storm that came over there, it just didn't go over at all. Whether it came here every <laughs> single day that we ever do, we always be pulled out on the week. All right. All right. All right, we're coming out. Are we going, are we stopping down at the old house side or are we going on? Do you want to? What do you think? I mean, they're going to see more of this. I think this is plenty. Okay. When's the ladies going to be there with the food? It has hog manure on it if they did want to see it. But Oh, yeah, you can show them that. But I'm guessing our food's probably about there. I think we're running short enough on time. Is it? 11.46. Yeah. Oh. That's a monster. I'm just going to pick that one for fun. Yep. Uh, good. Hey, David, you think we can grow them all like that? Do what? You think we can grow them all like that? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe at 17, 18,000. Hey, uh, you can do anything if you get a little rain. That's right. Well, all right, do you guys want to look at one more field or you guys want to go on into the AC? I'm going to let you guys decide. It's got the hog manure on it. It's got hog manure on it. The next one we'll drive by and then we'll drive by. So we'll go down here. It's not this field. This field does not have hog manure on it. Uh, about 100 yards this way, we'll get next to our neighbor's cornfield so you can look at it i can't tell you you can walk in it but you can look at it driving by um we don't want to get in trouble but you'll see the difference when we drive by um you'll see it and then all the corn on the right side is ours so this field here and then we'll skip over the guy's house and then we'll hit another field that other field on the corner of the crossroads does have hog manure on it it'll be on your north side and then we'll turn down that gravel road the church is straight down that gravel road all the corn on the right until we get to the next crossroad will will be ours too so are we stopping at the old house site and walking in or no what do you guys want to do? We want to stop again or go ahead and go to the, get lunch? Do they want to look at beans? We drove past the beans, all fired up on corn. If you guys want to see beans after lunch, you can stick around after one and we can we can look at some beans. What do you think? You guys want to stop again? What do you think, Nathan? Whatever you want to do. All right. Okay. Tell us. All right, Gary. Gary decided it for us. We're gonna go look at the hog manure field, and you guys can see. He had some questions for me. Who did? Gary. When when did you plant this? Nope. This was planted. We have a vehicle here. Uh, okay, where's that up there? April. I'll take you to this was two weeks later. Two weeks later. That's exactly right. He already knew. He already knew. Okay. Is the same number we just came out of. Planted a day later, same fertility program, except for this does have 6,000 gallons of hog manure on it. All right. Now, unless you guys can pencil out 
the expenses and see if this is going to pay for itself. We're going to have to wait until the, the combine goes through it. Uh, right now, I have my doubts. I'm, I'm thinking the no hog manure actually looks better. What I've realized this year is with that excessive amount of hog manure, it does dry out quicker. It does stress faster, but it does have a lot there to work with. So, I mean, it's still all right overall. The hog manure stuff is still all right. You guys uh, feel free to walk in, um, pick an ear, do whatever you want to do, look it over. Um, one thing we haven't talked much about is the health of the, the leaves, right? That's where we first look usually when we're looking for diseased plants is on the leaf surface. Um, guys, I'm, I'm not just saying this, but we've been hard pressed to find even gray leaf spot this year, which is a very common disease that's not yield robbing, but it's very common. Um, the health of these plants have been exceptional all year. So that's why we stopped here because it's the same number planted a day apart right down the road. The only difference is this does have 6,000 gallons of hog manure on it. Anybody have any questions about this patch of corn right here? We can walk over there if you guys want. I know you're dying to get in the AC. Same thing, 28,000 population, 114 day variety. Um, it's probably a little taller, but I don't know that the ears are any bigger. But I'll let the combine decide that. Do you have any flocks that you have that are treated with your product and untreated? I do have one plot of non-GMO corn at home. Um, the riser blew up, so that corn got frosted. It was the first corn I planted. The non-GMO corn got frosted, and I planted it wet. It's, it was right there west of our house. The riser blew up, and we had enough pivots to service with our irrigator. We just left it. So it kind of burned up. I mean, it still got corn, you know, but it pinched off. Uh, a little bit lower yeah. and but yes there is I do have a plot in there of uh, 12 rows with no treatment naked non-gmo corn and then everything around it is all treated but everything that we've looked at so far has been treated yes that is correct with your yep. seed treatment yep the seed treatment yep no the biocharge uh, no the we had one gallon of sure grow but we didn't put the additives in with it we wanted Wanted to see how long throughout the season the treatment would last. So, what hybrid is this? This is the same, 5434. Yep. What was the what was the brand again? Dynagro. Dynagro. Yep. You know, one reason. Yep. Our big corn. Uh, when it gets stressed, it just falls on its face. And our short corn, which doesn't have as much water needs, and then it hangs mm -hmm. out. This is a lot taller corn, like you said. Yeah, so. What's your name again? I forgot. John. John. So John brought up something that I really have liked and like enjoyed talking about lately. I used to be the guy that was a huge advocate for short corn. I want a short statured plant and a humongous ear because with short corn comes two things. Less, less water utilization, less nutrients to pack into that plant. Now, take a year like this on a great year on a gravy year you get timely rain hey that's that's great nothing wrong with that if you look a lot of your racehorses under irrigation that are bred for high yields they're not tall varieties your older less messed with genetics end up being your silage corns tall corns but guess what they'll still put a big ear on too um I'm an advocate for tall plants because on a year that's dry you Yes, it takes more to grow that plant. But listen, if you have 114 day corn 
that's still 114 day corn, whether that plant's six feet tall or whether that plant's 12 feet tall. You're still in the vegetative growth stage the same amount of time. Yes, it takes more nutrients and more water to get that plant taller, but with our microbes, we're able to supply that. Now, down the road through the reproductive stages, say you get to uh, R2, R3, and you're in a full-blown drought, and that corn doesn't have enough water, enough moisture in the soil to fill. Guess what it's gonna do? It's gonna go to the rest of the stock. It's gonna start pulling. It, you know, some people call it cannibalizing itself, but it's gonna start pulling not just nutrients, but water and supplying it to the ear. And it'll start at the bottom, work its way up to below the ear leaf, then it'll go to the top and it'll start working its way back down. If you've got a six foot tall corn plant to do that with, um, you're probably not gonna last long. If you have a 12 foot tall corn plant to work with, you've got a lot more reserves there. It's kind of like building your bank account for the bad times. That's how I look at tall corn now. Um, and uh, honestly, the sure grow, um, it really does help get the growth out of it early. Uh, Kyle had the perfect picture for that early on. He kind of got Facebook famous on that one. He had some I didn't sign huge the corn. Yeah, don't sue me. No. <laughs> no. So you're kind of like the trend now, <clears throat> the big news is the short stature corn. Yeah, that, that came trendy. Like, uh, you know, they're coming out with the smart corn and on all that stuff. That kind of became a thing. And before, after I was a, I was an advocate for short corn and, and now I've kind of went the other direction and somebody asked me the other day well what do you think it would take for these seed companies to uh, start breeding taller corn again and I said a little bit of money a little bit of money you know get some taller corn everything will be tall again yep I mean honestly but uh, so though <clears throat> the short corn like you were talking same number of leaves i would assume per plant you're just your inner node length is different yes and no it, i think a lot of that you know you sometimes you can get 18 nodes and sometimes you get 12. like a lot of that's probably your corn because mm -hmm. hmm. i had some that was stressed early and then stuff that i had that I had later planted and you can see they stack them tighter node. yeah yeah they stack them tighter yep which, you know, it's funny how different soybeans and corn are with going from a legume to a grass, but you plant soybeans early to stack your nodes tighter, you plant your corn early, you think you're gonna get more height out of it, but not. that's not always true. Sometimes the later corn ends up being shorter um, or taller because it's got the cool nights to work with. So it just depends on the year. This is a year you planted early and you got really, really tall corn. Not not everybody, but I mean, we've probably seen it in this area more than not, wouldn't you say, Kyle? Yeah. So, but yeah, this is the, the hog manure. What do you guys think? That's good. Synopsis. Are you a manure salesman? I'm not a hog manure salesman. Nope. You were the purchaser. I was the purchasee, yes. Purchaser, whatever you call it. Yep, all right, you guys ready? Um, we don't have to stop on down the road. We got the same variety of corn again, and it's on the right side, and it does not have hog manure. So you can look at it as you drive by. It looks, looks pretty green, so I think it'll be all right. that Wade did it, uh, Nature's Formula. We've been working with Wade yeah, four seasons now. Bill Strange is right there. He's the owner and founder of the company. Uh, still heavily involved. He's the creator of all the products that we have to offer as well. Right there besides him in the red shirt is his son and CEO of the company, Nathan Strange and he just came on board to kind of take over. So uh, Bill's plan is to continue, get back in the lab and continue making more different products and stuff. So got big uh, plans to have a lot more coming out in the near future. 
Uh, obviously got Wade Sprinkle here. Uh, he's the got a depot here. So if you, anyone is interested in any of the products, he that's where you can get it. He's the only depot in Missouri and this side of Kansas. Uh, then also you all met like Ivan and Caleb Fintel out there. They're dealers up in Nebraska. Been using it a long time. My name's Peyton Owens. I'm the sales manager. And then Jackie is marketing and uh, social media and stuff. So all this will be on YouTube then too for you all to go back or that's a good way to learn about the products. We've got several videos on there explaining different things. Uh, Oh, and then, yeah, we got the Mangums here from Louisiana. Sorry about forgetting them, but that's Thomas and Ray Mangum. They're uh, dealers for us down in Louisiana. We made the drive all the way up here. So Bill started this company. We, this is our 10th year actually in business, but then the product is actually BioSure Grow itself. He actually formulated in the early 90s. So it's been around a very long time. And his vision and goal when he started this company was to help farmers and ranchers uh, build profitable, sustainable operations with implementation of affordable natural products. So that's our mission statement and that's our goal. Uh, we just go direct to the farmer. Sure grows our main uh, product. We've got others to offer. Uh, like I said, we mostly highlighted Sure Grow today and kind of a little bit about it. Uh, it's a liquid microbial fertilizer, but it's not like pretty much any other biological on the market. Uh, Wade can tell his story if he wants about the first time he used it because he had been using other biologicals and kind of thought he knew what biologicals was. So. <laughs> uh, but what SureGrow is, it's a 48 different species of microbes that all work together in harmony. That's very important, and that's what sets, one of the reasons that sets us apart from other biologicals is all of our microbes that we have together work together to help balance the soil. We talked about that in the field, about balance. Uh, we're after balancing your soil, soil health. Uh, same as in livestock, with our livestock products, we're about balancing the gut. Because when everything is in balance, uh, everything just works a lot better in the soil livestock within your life, it's all connected. Uh, within that 48 different species, like I said, they work together. We've got nitrogen fixation microbes, microbes that work on the phosphorus, potassium. Overall though, they're working to build your soil, balance it out. Um, anything else? I guess the price then too, what everyone, we've had the same, Bill created the product and then the company 10 years ago and we've had the same price for 10 years now. It's $15 per gallon for our regular plus shipping when you buy 55 gallons or more. And it's our goal and mission to keep it that way for as long as we possibly can and we're very confident we can uh, keep it at that price. So you're looking at basically $15 an acre. We create all the product down at our facility at Brownsboro, Texas, and then ship it out to our depots from there. Uh, so we control everything about the product. It's made in-house. We own the microbes, so. Wade, you got any question? Can you go over the plus B and the plus M price and then the seed treatment stuff? Yeah, I'll let Wade do the seed treatment, but plus B then, it's an additive. Uh, Wade briefly covered it, but it's a special microbe we add into it that lives, you spray it on and the plant uptakes it, predatory insect bites the plant and just the microbe and the microbe eats the insect from the inside out essentially. That's an extra $3 per gallon for that additive. And the plus M is an enzyme that will protect the crops from mold or fungus and it is an extra $4 per gallon. We also can make micronutrient packs based off your soil sample where we can add your trace minerals back and that's like I said tailor made off your soil samples and that's an extra three dollars no matter if we got to add one micronutrient or five micronutrients whatever we got to add it's just three dollars per gallon extra i was talking with wade some i guess if you guys or anybody else in here done studies with the matocytes on the plus b in like soybean environments or soil health 
I guess the plus B considered an amount of size as far as they count for CC. Yeah, So, Kyle, wow. I don't know if my voice just carries more than yours or what. Um, okay, I can stand up here with him. So, Kyle asks if the plus B works as a nematicide as well. So, we have been studying that and a couple years into it, we are seeing very promising results. We have staked no claims in a nematicide. That is we, what we have done with the biocharge is we have amped things up, like I told you, in the field, and we are preloading that seed with a high load, and we are uh, testing the soil again. Everyone who got it this year, we will be pulling soil samples. Some guys, we have not got those yet, um, but we will be pulling soil samples around harvest time and checking the cyst nematode populations, um, how many eggs per 100 cc's of soil. So um, from a couple years ago, just by spraying the sure grow and the plus B on our soybean plants, because I had done some in furrow, I had sprayed some, um, the ones that I had sprayed on and um, in furrow showed a de like less than where we didn't apply any, but where I had sprayed it, we had counts down under a thousand eggs per hundred cc. So we had, um, which talking to you about it some, I mean, there's guys in the eight, yeah, over a hundred thousand. Um, that's pretty substantial. We, our numbers were down around, um, you know, seven, 10,000, but it would drop underneath a thousand where we used the plus B on just spraying it on the, the plants. So we believe that, you know, a nematode is still a predatory insect. It bores its way in underneath um, and sets up shop and starts to redistribute all the nutrients and in, uh, to them. So it literally sucks the life out of your soybean plant. So we call it sudden death syndrome. A lot of you guys have heard that term. That is probably, arguably, the number one yield robber in a soybean field is sudden death syndrome. Most of the time, you can't see it until it's too late. Extreme cases, it'll prematurely die, and you say, oh, that was sudden death syndrome. But a lot of times, you have the pressure out there under the soil, you don't see it, but it's limiting your yield. Maybe it's 50%, maybe it's 20%, maybe it's 60 or 80%. Maybe you those beans go ahead and go out to maturity, but you have lost a substantial amount of yield that you didn't even know. Um, because the plant looks okay, um, you will start, if it's real bad, you'll start to have potassium deficiencies uh, showing up, things of that nature. Um, so yeah, we don't stake the claim in the nematicide, but that is the whole goal behind um, also on like the biocharge. That's what we're trying to do with, with it is eliminate those cyst nematodes. And just to kind of piggyback on the testing, uh, anything we do, obviously the product's been around a very, very long time, been used on a wide application of crops uh, all over the United States. Uh, it, BioSugar works on anything that grows out of the soil. But within that, for testing, we don't really do, we don't do university testing, we do real world testing on farms just like Wade's, on farms just like Caleb's. Uh, they are our testers and they give us the feedback before we release any type of products. Uh, so every, we don't you know, stake any claims until we've seen it proven out in the real world on farmers and we do it several locations, not just one or two locations. So, On the, oops, turn my mic off. 
So real fast on the biocharge, because I know there's a lot of guys here that grow um, silage corn, uh, alfalfa, grass, um, different small grains for uh, forage for their cattle. Uh, we want to talk a lot about that. We've, we've kind of been in corn mode. Um, corn excites me, if you guys can tell. I love corn. Um, but we, we need to cover those other things. So real quick, I'm just going to talk about the charge, the biocharge real fast. And then um, if I know we've got a couple guys in here, uh, Kevin, he's, he grows alfalfa. Um, shoot, there's other guys in here. Um, David, he's ran it on some different small grains. Um, so we might have some of these guys talk a little bit about what they've done. We'll have Nathan come up and discuss some stuff about grass and Peyton. They'll probably tag team that. And then, uh, yeah. So on the biocharge seed treatment. So where we're at is $12 a unit on soybeans. Okay. I should have had this on a PowerPoint. But... We're $12 a unit on soybeans. We are $30 a unit on corn. And that sounds like a lot, but there's 80,000 seeds per unit in corn. So I would say average population, you're gonna be looking at somewhere around $10.50 an acre. Um, so we can drop that, you know, most time guys are planting a unit of beans an acre so that's about 12 bucks an acre corn it's gonna be a little cheaper like i said um, majority of the time we're not going to be applying the colorant on the corn on top of the already coated seed treatment on that seed um, wheat we are six dollars a unit on wheat okay and that gives some guys some flexibility in there with uh, how much, how many pounds per acre they're putting on. So some guys will run a bushel and a half. Some guys will run two bushels, what have you. So that's where we're at uh, this first year out of the gate. We're going to run with those numbers. We think that with what you're getting, um, here's Paul. Hey, Paul. Um, so that's where we're at on the treatment. Um, if you guys are interested, uh, contact me, get with me, whatever. If you guys are needing wheat treated this fall and you're local, that's going to obviously be really easy. Um, if you are not local, then we need to put a schedule together and get guys taken care of but just know for beans and corn if you guys are not within you know a reasonable distance here um, then then we'll, we can look at seed options um, i'm going to tell you my two passions with that that go along with farming is product placement which i mean seed i love like i don't put a hybrid on a farm because it's the best hybrid on the market i put a hybrid on a farm because that's the best soil for that hybrid you you got to maximize your potential on each acre every acre is not the same so product placement is huge for me, um, especially working with guys in the past that just sell you a bag of seed and they want you to just go plant it. Well, you're not going to get the best bang for your buck like that. So if you don't live around here and you are interested in the treatment and possibly talking about seed, I'm guessing we probably carry something um, that you guys have had on your farm before. So that is an option. Like I said, we can go coast to coast, north to south, get whatever anybody needs on that. Um, am I missing anything? Any questions right now? I'm easily confused, so pardon this question. Biocharge is what you're going to be putting on seed treatment. That is your mix of a lot of different microorganisms and bacteria, right? Yep. And that is doing what? 
So that is, so you're getting your, your natural, because it's all natural. So you're getting your insecticide, you're getting your fungicide, you're getting your full load of inoculant. So if you go take your, so say we're talking soybeans, and you're taking your soybeans to your local whoever dealer, I can't name specific brands, but you say, I want inoculant, so I'm going to pay eight bucks for inoculant or whatever they charge. I mean, some guys go clear to 12 just for inoculant. And what they do is they're, if they get a speck on your seed, it's inoculated, right? So we're taking it and fully coating it. Like when it comes out of our treater, it's wet. Like they, you can reach in the box and grab them and I mean, they're stuck to your hand. We're fully coating it because we know what it takes to get enough of those microbes on that seed to do the things that we're wanting them to do. We haven't even talked about the, the you know, bacteria that fixates nitrogen. That's why we get away with half the amount of nitrogen that we used to apply. We don't use any FOSS besides what's in the litter. Um, there's enough potassium in our ground to last two lifetimes probably and phosphorus to last probably 10 generations. So um, like Peyton touched a little bit, in, in these microbes, microbes all, they're all soil native microbes. So they're not lab created. They all had a job in the soil before Bill put the product together, right? And their job still remains. 74-ish percent of microbes are trainable. So if you take a jug of sure grow and go put it on your farm, your farm's different than David's farm. You might have high levels of FOSS, or David might have high levels of FOSS. You both, you used to be a dairyman, ex-dairyman, that was funny. Um, so you might have some things happening out there, some tie up, you might, you, you might apply 200 pounds in and you're really only getting 50, right? Um, so depending on what's going on on each guy's farm, until we restore that balance, well, how are we restoring that balance? We're taking the micro and letting them go to work. So there's 48 different like species, but then there's thousands of subspecies and they all have their own diet. Some really like FOSS, some really like iron, some really like molybdenum, zinc, manganese, potassium, calcium, I mean, you, you name it. Any mineral that's in our soil, these microbes, that was their job to remain, you know, keep balance in the soil. So what they'll do is if they go into your soil and you're got, you've got hot spots, they're going to start to metabolize your phosphorus and when they eat, they secrete. So then they leave an enzyme. An enzyme cannot tie up um, elements, right? It can't tie up um, minerals like um, you know, aluminum doesn't affect an enzyme that you've created, right? But aluminum, um, what's aluminum going to do in your soil? What's it going to tie up? Give somebody a candy bar. Phosphorus, calcium, it affects phosphorus and calcium. So you can put the sure grow down and in the first year you can see your, your base saturation levels of potassium start to come up. You can see your cal to mag ratio start to come more into balance. You can start to see these things take place. And over time, they get in what I call the green zone. They get in the good zone um, because if if everything was right and the only thing you had wrong was high FOSS, so you're tying up nitrogen, you're tying up calcium, your pH might get whacked and your nitrogen won't release for your corn crop. So you put the sure grow down and 74 or 5% of these microbes are, are going to, since they're trainable, they'll go to working on the FOSS until they restore the balance, then they revert back to their natural food source. So that's how they're working. They're very intelligent. 90 percent of our 
yourselves are made up of microbes. You know, I mean, that's just how God created things. It's, it's amazing. So it's the same product of the morning and the meat. It's the same product. Um, yes, it is. It's got fungi and bacteria in it. Ah, so it does have it does. Yeah. Yep. Yes, sir. Okay. And then the, what was it, the M and the B? Yep. That's in addition to this? That, so the M and the B, our program, our protocol for, guy, for guys everywhere would be what we would um, say is the best case scenario. Treat your seed with biocharge. When that when that plant gets up and growing, come back over the top with a gallon of sure grow with plus B and plus M, and you are going to be lights out. You're going to be in good shape. What you guys saw today was all biocharge. We didn't end the, a gallon of sure grow, but it did not have the plus M and B. So you know, there's a few insects out there, no disease, but what we're wanting to do is just make sure guys have the best possible outcome. So the most protection that you can get would be the full treatment plus the gallon with the, I call it the full load, you know, fully loaded sure grows what it, is how I refer to it at home to Eric is this guy wants fully loaded sure grow plus M and B. So that's our regimen that we advertise. Um, that gives us full confidence that guys have what they need there to protect themselves. Any other questions? from anhydrous which probably helped with that as well but uh, you know the carrier let's talk a little bit about the carrier um, in Shuro we've got so it's a chelated analysis of NP and K uh, it does have some uh, micros in it and but it's got uh, peat moss and manure in it so it's you know it's got humic acid um, very good for building organic matter. The first year we used it, we were actually on a full tillage program. Uh, we ran a Kinsey mock till high speed disc, five and a half, six inches deep. We drug that thing, I mean, everywhere. And we still increased our organic matter on average about half a percent. We had some fields that we increased it um, quite a bit more than that. It would sound crazy if I told you, but we're doing that with the, the root mass too. So on soybeans, it's just like that corn out there. You start digging between two 30 inch rows and you dig down an inch and you're hooking, you're hooking beans, um, roots, and they'll nodulate clear out to the tip. So running tissue samples on soybeans, you're getting five to 6% nitrogen in the leaf tissue, which is excessive. But, and they preach to you, 60 bushel beans, that's all a soybean plant can, can fixate enough nitrogen for as a legume. 60 bushel, that's your cap. The rest is gonna have to get out of your organic matter and your soil. So that runs a guy up to maybe 80 bushels. What we're seeing in places where, I mean, we've, no lie, we've went up in the 150s on soybeans in, in places. And we can do that because the nodulation is insane. Instead of having 20 nodules fixate nitrogen down there, we've got 120. You know, we have exponentially increased um, our nitrogen fixation in our, in our soybeans. The worms, so to go, I about lost track. The worms came, came on, we actually had a hatch. How many of you guys have ever seen earthworms hatch in your field? Like I didn't physically see the eggs, but I saw the babies and it was crazy. So you've seen that before? Oh, yeah. Like we pulled up a T-post out of our cover crop and it would just 
loaded. Yeah, crazy. So if you're doing cover crops and you're doing things like that, you're already on the right track um, because you are getting that biology established, um, those different microbes because of those crops and, you know, gives them a host. To, to live and thrive. So our, our earthworm population has totally exploded from used to, you find one every now and then in a scoop full of dirt. And now, especially if we had a good rain, um, uh, after a rain, you'll usually see a bunch of wormholes poking through everything. And yeah, pretty awesome to see that. So those guys don't quit. They're working all the time when we're not. We're eating pie and ice cream in the air condition. Those worms are still feeding. Anything else? All right. You guys want to hear some stuff about grass? Yes. Uh, applications, how to apply. These are some questions that we've had. Um, David, what were you wanting to know? Just uh, like timing on application um, like in a hay field you know do you want to go full rate you know um, how long does the plus B last yeah, do, you, or do you want split rates on hay fields or yeah if you're putting out a plus M or B on that or um, you know what kind of uh, best best timing on even just you know, strictly pasture fields and stuff yeah, it would still be a gallon an acre would be your application rate. Uh, it's kind of like a pasture. Uh, when it's starting to come out of dormancy is a good time to hit it. And then it just kind of depends on how hard you graze it as to whether if you graze it down to the ground, I would suggest hitting it again midway through the season. If you know, you're know you not grazing it, I mean, that one application can last you a long time through the whole season. Uh, like alfalfa situations, we recommend typically, especially for the plus B, you can get two cuttings out of it because it's living within the roots after that first cutting and regrows. But then you take that second cutting, it's starting to just kind of get weak. So you got to reapply another gallon. Uh, any any uh, type of crop you're going to be applying on a gallon is a sweet spot. We've had people try two gallons up front. It didn't really make any difference. Uh, now you can spread it out and spoon feed it. People have done that, <laughs> like fertigate uh, and stuff, a quart or a pint every time they're running water and you're just spoon feeding it throughout the whole season. And that works great too. But especially for the additives, if you're doing plus B plus M, you want that one gallon rate. And then like on your corn and beans, that's good all season long once you get that one gallon on there. So you really want to, want to apply it to a, a hay or pasture field, uh, you know, say late September, when you don't have a lot of growing days left, would that be kind of a waste or, I mean? Within like the next month, I mean, we would be wasting our time basically within the next month. So, I mean, you will still get residual for from it for next year, not maybe necessarily the plus B, but those microbes are still working on your soil and building your soil. So a lot of guys will, like on alfalfa, do it, you know, before the first cutting, before the third cutting, and then hit it again either right before the fourth, just so they got full strength all the way through, or right before the fifth, just kind of whenever their insect problems are going to typically show up. Do you see any effect on the alfalfa weevil using this? Yes. Here. Complete control. Say that again. Complete control. Because we are. I mean, they got to take a bite of the insect. And then. And I mean, if it's a. During drought situations, the plant's stressed and stuff. So that's when you're in. I mean, the insect's job is to come in and take wheat, weak plants. <laughs> So, I mean, if it's a, a drought situation, everything just stays, the plus B will not control as well as if it's a good year drought and everything. But yes, it will control them. And that's just the hard thing to remember about the plus B, to wrap your head around, they gotta take a bite for them to ingest that microbe and then they get sick and die. So if you see any feeding, it's gonna be on the more stressed plants and stuff. 
typically or depend on the insect edges of the field. And then, yeah, they'll get in five feet, 10 feet, whatever. It just depends on how heavy your infestation is too. Yeah. Something like a weevil, they're hatching out there. You're gonna have a little bit of damage everywhere, kind of. Kevin, Kevin Mosley's had some of the most beautiful alfalfa that I've seen. And uh, he's up there, what, northeast of Macon. And uh, I'm gonna let him talk a little bit about it because this guy, he knows what he's doing whenever he's growing alfalfa. <laughs> this is only worth about what it's gonna cost you. So <laughs> um, I, I'm only on my second year of BioSure Grow. Um, but this year I have noticed that I do not have the bug problems that I had been always having before. Because always before I had to, uh, I, I just start cutting. I don't spray for bugs. I just start cutting because time you spray for them and wait, your alfalfa is too far gone. I, I, I put up my alfalfa for quality. I don't necessarily go for quantity as opposed to quality. I almost always get five cuttings a year on it. Um, but but this year I, I have not I've had zero bug problems at all since I've been applying that and I, I'm, I'm right now I'm going on the application rate of every two every two cuttings the next year I may I'm, I'm going to dedicate a sprayer to spray my alfalfa because it takes a long time to rinse out and I get busy and so uh, next year I'm going to try cut half rate on every cutting or before you know and and see if that makes much of a difference or not but that is that is that's my goal for next year Double seeding leaf size. I'm sorry. Ninth in the leaf size. Last year, last year we had a um, we was good on water last year, and uh, my third and fourth cuttings of alfalfa was running 25 inches tall at 28 days, uh, and, and I've I've never had alfalfa that tall before before I started applying that. Now this year we. We lucky if we get uh, well. Right now, it's almost ready to cut. It's 18 inches tall. Uh, I've had one inch of water since the last cutting on it, and um, that's all I've had on it. And it. I'm getting ready to start my fourth as soon as the weather clears for this week. And so, but no, it's it's done very good. And and we generally try to cut. Depends on the, on the, on the growing. Uh, I, I try never to go more than 28 to 30 days. Um, if, if we got good rain and moisture coming in, uh, I've cut as, as quick as uh, 22 days. So just, j it just depends on, on the weather and when I get the weather right. Do you, do you test your hay and stuff? Have you seen any difference in tests as far as applying the pure grow and the tests are higher or anything like that? Uh, not, not enough significantly yet uh, to, to tell, tell a difference. On that, uh, like I said, this is only my second year on it. Uh, we are pulling, we will be pulling s soil samples every year. We've done some plant tissue samples last year. I have not done it yet this year. Uh, so, I mean, I'll, I'll, we'll see uh, what time will tell. Uh, you know, it's not just a one and done type of a deal. But, uh, um, but we, are, we are looking to see what that changes. Um, over the years, using the biosugar on, on oops, question and answer, what have you seen on, on I know it, it uh, on one of the handbooks it talks about raising your well, feed values 20 or 30 points. Um, have you seen different effects in different crops as far as like raising the sugar levels of the plant and the forage sample or um, raising protein levels or anything kind of? that, you know, you quantify in that forage test as far as what you've seen over the years? Or? Do you know the answer to that? Because I haven't had anyone work with anyone that took forage samples and stuff, so. <clears throat> We've seen uh, across the board on uh, different crops, for the, we raised the uh, value about 10% uh, uh, across the board. Some uh, uh, crops do better than others. We've done a lot with wheat, grazing wheat out in West Texas, and uh, they seen a significant uh, value uh, uh, upward. Okay. It seems like it, I used it on a, a tree kitty, 
uh, for Floyd and uh, my, my, of course, it was early to get together, but it seemed like my energy levels were higher than I've ever seen them in that porch, you know? So, of course, I don't have consistent, you know, data to back it up against. Right, right. But, okay. Any other questions about anything we've covered so far? So would you treat small seeds like before you're planting them with this stuff? Yes, you can, yeah. So we forgot to talk about, um, we talked a lot about out there what our fertility program is. But uh, it, it, I'm sure, differs a lot from y'all's fertility program. So we got away from dry fertilizer um, shoot five years ago, um, and uh, I know a lot of guys still use dry fertilizer, and that's okay. We're not saying that you need to stop right now. But if you're doing that, typically what we tell guys is, you know, you don't have to bet the farm that uh, the sure grow is going to going to sustain you. you what, what we usually recommend is at least on some of your acres, take 50 percent of your dry fertilizer and and don't apply it. So apply half of it with a gallon of sure grow and watch what happens. Um, what we've done is kind of stair step down. We used to be 100% um, fertilizer in furrow, and we got away from that and went to the litter so we can feed the whole soil profile. Like I said earlier in the cornfield, we look at that litter as a food source for our microbes. Um, so we feel like that's working very well for us. Um, but not everybody has the same program. I'm not saying that anhydrous is, you know, gonna kill everything and you're not gonna raise anything. Two years ago, we still used anhydrous. We pulled our rate back to 125 pounds of N um, pre-plant. And I mean, we're talking like a week or two before planting. And we ran a gallon of sure grow in furrow and we averaged on some fields 249 bushels. So a lot of 300 bushel corn out there. So anhydrous still works. We'll not say that anhydrous and dry fertilizer still doesn't work. It works, but you have to find what's right. Can you save money? Can you be more efficient in other applications? Yes. You can. Can you take better care of your soil? Yes, you can. And in turn, it'll take better care of you. But it's all process. You're not just going to do it overnight. And we understand that. Have you done any checks with nothing but the power of the Yeah, last year was a pretty big check. It was everything. Um, we did all of our corn and beans with with just a gallon of sure grow. It was such a tough year. You know, some of these guys are here today. You know, I know David was here at the field day last year. He walked through that corn um, with no nitrogen, no P and K, no litter, no nothing, a gallon of sure grow. Um, you know, it, it was crazy. So we still, the, the heat and the drought zapped us. Like, there's no doubt about it. Pinched our ears off. There's nothing we could do. Um, but test weight was crazy. So we still had some of that corn we hauled to the elevator was 63 pounds. Was it not? I'm, yeah, I'm not storing on a gallon of sure grow and nothing else. So was the yield there? No, not really. Um, but that more of that was heat and drought stress. Did the corn look very good? To tell you the truth, not really. It didn't get as tall. Um, we had lots of rain early. It didn't get rooted down well. Uh, what, and then it got hot and dry late. So what I tell guys is in 
the perfect world. Like if we're in the tropics growing two corn crops a year and you get timely rains, your soil, it won't hold water like a pond. Um, in a perfect world, a gallon of sure grow will grow you a good corn crop. But we have so many environmental factors. All the rain that we can sometimes get in the springtime, that hurts us a lot. And that's what hurt us last year. Because what I like, you hear people talking about nitrogen applications. So if you've got nitrogen out there and dry fertilizer, your roots will look a lot different than our roots looked. They'll be more long and stringy and white and not have as many hairs. And the way they um, actually developed. <laughs> some crop and some fertilizer was they take dirt, they put it in its own confinement and they homogenize it, pull it out, start adding fertilizer and your roots are actually working as straws. Like it's just using what's available and sucking it up to supply it. So in my mind, I need a little bit of that. Like I need in the times where it's wet and our microbes, they're just like you, you guys in here. If you're underwater, you can't breathe. You start to die. You're just literally doing everything you can to stay alive. If it's super, super dry, you can't work, so you, you stop because you don't have any energy to keep going. You don't want to burn up your energy you've got and end up, you know, dying of heat exhaustion or, um, you know, you guys know where I'm going with that. So they need good, consistent soil moisture to thrive and heat units and just like us. When we thrive, they thrive. So if you've got excess water early, I believe you need some nitrogen there to pull from, right? Um, if they have to take it in, in nitrate form, then that's what they gotta do. Um, so I'm an advocate of between 75 and 100 pounds in, have it there, pre-plant. The phosphorus and potassium, I am totally 100% sold. Last year, yes, corn was short, but most of that was environmental. There was no streaking in the plants. There was no purpling on the edges of the leaves with phos deficiency. There was no striping down the leaves um, for a sulfur or manganese deficiency. There was no... Um, Pot, uh, potassium deficiencies on the edges of the leaf. The only thing that we did see was nitrogen deficiencies because our microbes were not able to fixate the nitrogen they needed to earlier on because they were way too drowned it out. I mean, it was sopping mess for the longest time. So that's what I'm an advocate for, 75 to 100 pounds of in on a corn crop. On beans, you can grow a great bean crop with a gallon of sure grow. No doubt about it, because they supply their own nitrogen. Does that kind of answer that? I know we talked about it a little bit, but what have you seen in your <clears throat> soil tests over the years using the sure grow on your PK? Yeah, so I need to get this stuff published, but like everybody else, you try to just stay focused and keep your business running. Um, but on the soil samples, our organic matter has increased every year. This year, back in the spring when I took soil samples, was the first year I saw an increase in P and K. So come off and coming off of a year with not applying any, and some of that ground we actually chopped the corn for silage. We mowed it and baled it. And we saw an increase in phos and potassium, which was really cool. And some of our soil tests had 200 pounds of potassium there that was not there the year before. So really neat to see that. Um, so yeah, on, you know, and that's going into the four, that's three years of using the product. So it's not gonna happen overnight. Do you want to talk about your soil samples real quick, Caleb? I know you've tracked that. Yeah, if I can think of all the all the levels, but um, no, yeah, a, a big one that really jumps out is your organic matter going up. Um, 
we've seen that fairly consistent. Um, uh, the the other the other thing you just see levels kind of go into what you talked about, go into the green zone um, as far as pulling. Some pull back, others others move forward. Um, you're seeing um, we're seeing a balancing. Um, we're seeing those ratios um, that that I think are really important to watch. Um, uh, go go into um, go into balance, and so that's that's kind of what kind of the high level overview of what what we're seeing um, across the board and. Every farm's different um, that we have, so some need a little bit of work yet, and and others, uh, I'm really pleased with where we're at. So. And more is not always better, right? Correct. Yeah, we're doing a pretty similar program to Wade. Um, we found that the the best to basically what he's talking about mitigate the risk of adverse weather conditions. We're putting um, on our irrigated. We're putting about 108 pounds of in on. Um, that's in a liquid form that we put um, right at at planting. Um, that we go over the top with. It's um, that's sprayed on with with herbicide in a lot of cases, and then um, for our non-irrigated, we're putting 85 pounds on, um, and we're getting getting through pretty much any adverse um, deal. That's a 40 to 50 percent reduction in um, input cost on nitrogen, and um, also cutting back on. Uh, zinc and sulfur applications finding um, that that that's uh, uh, helping as well so Wait, are you broadcasting uh, we spray it now so we started out in furrow and now we go over the top with the sprayer because now we are treating the seed and we're feeling like we're getting the best of both worlds. So when you go in furrow, essentially, I mean, yes, you're getting that gallon in the, you know, you're banding it in the, in the furrow. So you're getting that benefit. But if we can put such a heavy load on the seed, you know, that's where you want it. And then you can get those microbes sprayed directly on the leaf and then they take it into the plant immediately. So we, we feel like that has been the best bang for the buck. And it showed up in the, in the crop this year. You know, we're hoping by the grace of God that we'll grow some of the better corn that we've seen on our farm in quite a few years. Um, so far, it's, it's looking pretty decent. We've got a little bit. Just one pass of one gallon per acre. Um, that is sufficient. Honestly, on soybeans, we've done a lot of different things with rates. We have ramped up, you know, we've ran a gallon in furrow and then came back over um, whenever we first start to bloom and we'll put another gallon on. We've pulled it back to, all the way to a quart and then in almost every seven days sprayed another quart. Um, I said earlier, my dad's the irrigation specialist. He really is. I mean, the guy's done it for 30 some years, but he's really good. Um, he actually, one day last year, he says, um, why don't you go spray it with Shuro and then I'm gonna put a circle of water on it and we're gonna keep doing that because every time we did that, it, we just, we put more blooms on and more pods and we retained them. So there's something to that, um, you know, giving it a shot, a shot of water. I kind of briefly talked about that at the first dry land field. So what we've seen over the last several years is our corn, and beans for that matter, they'll wait through, they'll wait on you through stressful conditions more so than they used to without it. And so what I mean by that is 
if we're, you know, in the middle of filling and we're in blister or milk and, and, uh, you good? And, um, we're in a drought, right? That corn will almost stay stagnant before it just burns up and shuts down. It will, it will just hang out and then it gets a shot of water and it's like, okay, now the microbes got some juice, we're gonna push. And that's what we've seen this year. And if you looked closely on some of those dry land years of corn, it like, you could see where it almost thought about pinching, but it didn't. And then it got a shot of water and it went ahead and went on up and filled to the tip. And so that I think has been, I mean, that's putting some serious money in a guy's pocket when you're talking, um, you know, 60, 70 bushel yield reduction if you're pinching off to if that plant will go ahead and wait on a rain, they'll only wait so long. I mean, you can obviously still burn up, but we're getting a lot more uh, days out of stress than we used to. This year we didn't. It was more so just kind of a test. We wanted to see, we created the seed treatment to protect the plants as a seedling, but we just were curious on how long it would last like through the growing season. So that we kind of did that for ourselves. It's estimated that every day you can do a black layer, you can eat five bushels. Uh, yeah, I could totally see that. I could totally see that. Yep. Well, just the difference in 56 pound corn and 60 pound corn is is insane, especially if you have the kernel counts there, you know. If you've got 200 bushel possibility at 56 pounds, um, same amount of kernels and you bump it to 60, I think you're gonna add somewhere around, according to my old math, just remembering 24 to 26 bushels, um, just having heavy corn. So, yep, it's big deal. Through, through your seed treater, can you treat like multiple, like a cover crop mix? Mm -hmm. You know, yep. without having to recalibrate or anything? You know what I'm talking about? Like, yeah. you got different size seeds. Uh -huh. So it all is based on density. So we can. Um, you can, his question was, can you treat a cover crop mix? Yes, we can. Because uh, the way you have to measure it and weigh it and calibrate it, it's based off of density. So if you've got multiple cereal grains um, mixed with uh, brassicas or you name it in this mix, it's still all getting weighed together and the dense you know you're still accounting for the density together and then it's all going to get sprayed and tumbled and yes we can we can any any type of seed we can run it through that thing yeah that i'm aware of put it that put that disclaimer in there there might be something some weird seed that blows in the wind that i don't know about <laughs> Um, like the row cropping system and how one of the, we wanted to cover three main topics today and that was how can I use sure grow in the seed treatment application how can I apply it what will it do for me and the cost which I think we've covered all of those yeah, so we've covered everything I had on the list. Is there any other questions about corn or soybeans and or grass or hay, any kind of hay, pasture? I know that guy back there in the back, he's kind of famous around here. He put some on his pasture last year and he said that's where his cows like to stay and they, they grazed there. And I know that's a lot of the story on uh, in Texas. Um, Nathan, you want to go ahead and talk?
talk a little bit. Put you on the spot. Yeah, put me on the spot. This one. As far as this grass and pasture. We've used it in several grazing operations and stuff that we've done. And it it's safe to put it out while they're grazing. You know, because everything's all natural. There's no, no chemicals or anything to it. And you see over time, like, like they're all getting to, the health of the grass just gets better and better. Any thin spots and stuff like that, you'll see it starting to broadcast, you know, getting everything blended in better. Um, so what about like subpar grass that's like got a lot of weeds in it? You bet, what are you best off doing? Spraying your weeds, knocking them out, going over them with that in a couple days after when they're dying out? So your grass can just jump? Yeah. Is that, the, is that the way to do that? Well, you can mix your, your chemicals with it. So you're saying go over one application, spray, mm -hmm. have it mixed in your application, and you're done? Yes. And you'll get a better kill on the weeds. Yeah, At a gallon per acre still? Full right. Rate. Yes, a gallon per acre sure grow at a full rate of your herbicide. Because if you reduce your herbicide and you use a full gallon, you can bring the weeds back. Yes. You know, typically kill, because when you put anything with sure grow, it takes it into the plant. So in this case of herbicide, they'll take the herbicide directly into the plant and go to the roots, and you're gonna see the plant dying from the roots up. So the tops might be green, and you think it's not working, but you go out there and the plant's dead on the bottom half, and then the top eventually dies too. What's the recommended, if you're, if you're just basically wanting to use it to yeah, you can, if you want to reduce your herbicide rates, like on row crops and stuff, you can, we recommend you can do it up to like 50%, whatever you're comfortable, but up to 50%, and then use a pint or a quart, no more than a quart of sure grow per acre. And you'll get a good, very good kill. I would like to add to that, for my guys around here, I know everybody's got weird weed and grass resistance in certain areas. If you're going to cut your herbicide rate back, increase your coverage. That's, to me, that's a must. So if you're used to running 10 gallons to the acre and going and killing grass, um, go to 20 go to 20 gallons to the acre. It's gonna take you twice the amount of time. If you're trying to save money on herbicide, that's what I would do. Otherwise, spike your herbicide with a quart and stay full rate and go on with life. But the main thing that we have to think about is resistance. The microbes help take it into that plant to get a better kill, but you need more coverage. If you're gonna cut chemical, think about it. If you've got 32 ounces of Roundup going on a blade of grass per acre, that's not much, it's, that's like specs, right? So if you take what maybe would just be a few specs touching that grass and you double your coverage, now you, are you technically having the same rate if you have better coverage? Um, yeah, kinda. So increase your coverage if you're gonna do that, please. Any other questions? Hey, I, I'd second that on the cattle will raise the sugar growth rate and yeah. mix it up spare load and you got half of the 16 acre crash you're done when they finish it up and they graze it once and they're grazing the second time. And it's just like they don't go to that site that they don't get treated. Yeah, if everyone couldn't hear, he said his cattle, he split a field and the cattle graze where he sprayed the sugar on. That's typical, that's typical feedback we get when people split apply a pasture. I just started noticing that the last few days because they're getting the other side of graze down and the side that didn't get sprayed, there's a few weeds in there. Mm -hmm. 
they walk through it once, sometimes they have to the base on the other side. And that all ties back to the health. You know, that side's a lot healthier. That was a uh, 240 and now I and uh, the 40 should grow up. Always encourage anyone new to the products to you know some trials, do some split fields and stuff to prove the product to yourself, to see what it's capable of because it's capable of a lot of different things. And every farm's different. Everyone uses the product just a little different. Uh, the product fits into your operation. You don't have to change your operation to fit the product. Last thing I plan on saying. So in the little promo video that we did, um, that's been just kind of our passion to help other farmers um, just make it go. Because I talked a little bit about the game, right? That, you know, we're playing a game that we didn't set the rules to. You know, most of us start out, you've got a guy, maybe you still do, He's taking your soil tests. He's telling you how much fertilizer to apply for your yield goals. Um, you know, these are things that we didn't come up with. They're just telling us these are the rules to the game. You want to grow 200 bushel corn, then you need this, 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 and this. Well, why don't we create our own set of rules that works for us? Let's be in charge of our own operation instead of the guy making $70,000 at the co-op um, and getting kickbacks for selling more fertilizer. Take control of the amount of money that you guys spend per acre on your, uh, on your crops. That's what we've done. That's why I can stand up here and talk about it till the day is long because I'm passionate about it because what Bill put together, it works. It works for us. And since it works for us, I know it worked for you. And we're not about, we, we do what we do and we stay, we stick with what we do best. So, Yes, is there guys out there that we see that are like, you know, no matter what, when that guy goes to bed tonight, the first thing he would still do in the morning, even if you helped him, was call your landlord and try to get your rented ground away from you. Those guys are going to be out there. But I think the majority of farmers all have the same heart to help each other and help each other thrive. And that's what we're about. So it's different. It's totally different. Um, but even my granddad, who's been here since 1970, you know, he's he's seeing it. He sees the difference. Um, he has guys telling him now that's been his neighbors for years and years. You know, I love that stuff that your grandson's selling. You know, that's been the best stuff we've had on our farm in a long time. So there's things that you, we can evolve. We can figure out better ways than the guy at the co-op telling us that we need X amount of pounds to grow a certain amount of bushels. So just keep, a, keep an open mind, but at the end of the day, you gotta make sure that you keep, it, keep the doors open and uh, get a good crop. So we wouldn't ever wanna push you to do anything to jeopardize that. Yeah, and be sure to take all of our, uh, all three of us have our business cards up there. You can call us anytime with any questions. Even if you're in the field, just want to double check, make sure you're doing things right. Give us a call and we'll walk you through or answer any questions you have. Hey guys, uh, Caleb Fintel here with Nature's Formula and West Ivy Farms. On August 23rd, uh, we're going to have a field day at 10 a.m. We're going to start. Uh, at the Fox Hollow Golf Course and uh, come and learn how uh, the Nature's Formula products have, have impacted our operation 
and come see how Nature's Formula products can benefit your operation.